welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles with you, why don't we turn to the book of Hebrews as we continue in our study in the book of Hebrews. If, you, if you're new with us or if you're just joining us, we've been going through the book of Hebrews line upon line, precept upon precept for quite some time. It's been a good couple of years now. And we've made our way well into the book of Hebrews. Now we're in the third chapter. I said this uh, this morning, I think that maybe by the time we conclude with Hebrews, my son will be up here. He's only 11 months, so we've got some time. So if you've got your Bibles, we're turning. We're, we're picking up in Hebrews, the third chapter. And, and you know, we're picking up in the 13th verse. And if you were here last week, and were any of you guys here last week to hear Pastor Jim's message on encouraging each other daily? I'll tell you what. What a message. Let me, let me, let, let's pick up in Hebrews, the third chapter, in the 13th verse. And the writer of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews begins to write, and he says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, if you recall last week, this is an important verse. I really believe that we as the body of Christ have got to grab a hold of the, the importance of this verse in so many areas. There's, there's a couple few subjects here that the author is really hammering, and I want to kind of just touch real quick on what Pastor Jim talked about last week. You know that the Bible tells us, uh, Jesus Christ in John, the 15th chapter tells us that because the world hated him, they will hate us also. The book of James tells us that, that, um, that friendship with the world is enmity with Jesus, or with a, a friendship with the world is enmity with Christ, which means that they don't exist together. John, the 15th chapter, Jesus also tells us that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So we know that as members of the body of Christ, as people who follow after Jesus Christ, as Christians today, we know that if we are in the body of Christ, that we will be facing tough times because the world just doesn't see what we see. They don't see the light. They don't see where we're coming from. And there's never a compromise between the world and Jesus Christ. From the beginning of time, from when Adam and Eve first ate the apple, or the fruit, whatever fruit it was, it wasn't an apple, when they first partook of the fruit, to now, there's always been enmity between the world and God. And because we are members of that body, we partake in that. So the importance of this verse in the 13th, chapter, uh, 13th verse of the third chapter says to exhort one another daily. One translation says to encourage one another daily. As the members, and as, as, body, as the members of the body of Christ, you and I have got to come together as a family and exhort and build each other up to encourage each other daily. Because you know... We all experience it. We all live in this world. Like I just said, we're in this world, but we're not of it. We experience that this world wants to do the best it can to present itself to us by bringing us down, by pulling us back to its level, by bringing us back to where we came from. And if we as a body of Christ don't gather together and exhort each other, encourage each other daily, how then are we going to have the strength to endure, to, to proceed, to do all that God has called us to do and to be all that God has called us to be? So it is very important for us, the body of Christ, to exhort, to build up, to encourage each other on a daily basis. Now today I want to move past that statement into the next. You can see on the, on the screen I have it highlighted, while it is called today. You know, the interesting thing about this, this verse is, if you think about it, this verse with that, 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 that particular section of the verse that's highlighted, this verse without that still makes perfect sense. Let's look at it without while it's called today. But, what, but exhort one another daily, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It makes perfect sense. It, it says build each other up, encourage each other every day, daily, otherwise you're going to be hardened by, by the deceitfulness of sin. Yet the author of the book of Hebrews thought it important enough to emphasize that statement while it is called today that he reiterates the timing of that verse. He says, exhort one, each other, one another daily while you have today. Now, if the author of the book of Hebrews thought it important enough to emphasize the timing while you and I have today, I believe it's important enough for you and I to take a look at the concept of today. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the idea of living in today. The message, the title of this morning's message, are you ready for it? The title of this morning's message is called Today. If anything else, you remember what today's message is because it's today. And we're going to talk about today. 
But before we get into the meat of this morning's message, before we get into what I believe God has really touched on our lives, I believe that if you grab a hold of these concepts that we're going to talk about today, you'll be better prepared not only to live today, but also to understand how the past and how the future affects your life. But before we get into it, I want to give you some thoughts really quickly on today. Okay? Is that all right with you guys? Number one, not number one, but just a quick thought. As we cannot live yesterday today. Don't live yesterday today. So often, you know, yes, the, the, the things that have happened in the past are what bring us to this place right now. What has happened in the past is, who, what, is, is what has made you and I the way we are today. But the difference is, is that we cannot dwell in the past. We cannot live the days of yesterday today. We have got to live today today. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what the book, uh, what the Bible says, what Jesus Christ says. In the book of Luke, in the ninth chapter, you don't have to turn there, I'll just put it up on the overhead, but let me give you a little bit of background. Here in the book of Luke, in the ninth chapter, Jesus Christ is calling people to follow him. He's about to send his servants out. And he sees one person, one person comes to him and says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And he says, Fox and th foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Meaning, I have no home. I'm, I'm going wherever the Lord sends me. Another man, Jesus, comes to him and says, listen, follow me. And the man says, yes, you betcha. Let me go first bury my, bury my father. Jesus Christ says, let the, bed, let the dead bury their own. Another man comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, follow me. And the man says, absolutely, Lord, you got it. Let me just go say goodbye to everybody that's sitting at my house, and then I'm coming. I'm on my way. And then Jesus Christ comes, and he drops a bomb on each and every one of them and their mentality of let me, do my, let me handle my business. Let me take care of the things so that I, can, that I can, you know, move on. And Jesus Christ says to them, in Luke, the ninth chapter, in the 62nd verse, he says, no one, having put his hand to the plow... And looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We cannot live yesterday today, church. If you think about the example of a plow, if you look at the, the agricultural fields as they begin to plant, if you're driving on the freeway right up here off of California Street, you've seen the onion fields and the, and the fruit fields right there. And when they plow, when they make that, you know that the most efficient way to plant a crop is to have rows in parallel with each other so you make the most use of your land. If you plow one row this way and another row that way and another row this way, yeah, you might have a cool, neat-looking pattern, maybe like the grass on a baseball field, but you're not utilizing the most of your land. And Jesus Christ says, if you remember the illustration, if you think about the illustration of a plow, of, of oxen and a plow before them, if you say, I don't know what an oxen looks like, think of a big cow pulling a plow. And here the, here's the farmer working hard and they're pulling the plow and that plow's in the dirt and they're making the straight rows and they got to keep their eye forward. Jesus Christ says, if anybody puts their hand to the plow and they look back, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because if you're looking back, you're not looking at where you're going. You're paying attention to how well of a job you did, how straight of your line is, but you're not even paying attention to where you're going. And church, you and I, we cannot live in the past. We cannot bring yesterday into today. Are you with me? Another thought on today is we cannot live tomorrow today. We've got to live today today. If we live tomorrow today, then what we're doing is we're putting our faith, we're putting our stock in something that's not guaranteed. Let me show you what the Bible says about living tomorrow today in James the fourth chapter. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn there real quickly. James the fourth chapter. If you've got your Bibles, you can just turn a couple pages to the right. It's right after the book of Hebrews. James the fourth chapter. <clears throat> in the 13th verse, James is writing and he says, Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and we'll spend a year there. Buy and sell and make a profit. Now, let, let's look at this. He says, come now to you who say, today and tomorrow, we're going to go to a city. We're going to spend some time there. We're going to make a profit. We're going to sell our goods. To me, that sounds like a business plan. That doesn't sound like anything wrong. That doesn't sound like those people who have made that statement have made anything in error. But what James is saying, as we get to this a little bit more, is he's saying, listen, what you're doing is you're accounting that today, later today, that you're accounting for tomorrow. The days of the future are in line, that you're going to get them. And he, let's see what he says, continuing on. In the 14th verse, he says, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Verse number 15 goes on to say, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. What James is saying is, listen, it's all right to make plans. It's all right to have a business plan. It's all right to have an intention to go and make a profit and make some money and do your business. But he says, listen, don't put your stock in tomorrow. 
but rather put your stock in the Lord. If the Lord wills and I am still here, then let's go. The final thought as we get into the meat of this message this morning is we have got to live today, today. See, if we live yesterday today, then today would be called yesterday. If we live tomorrow today, then today would be called tomorrow. But if we live today today, then today is today. Whoa! <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, I know it's like 1030, but I, we're all still waking up. You're like, Pastor Luke, no, 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 we got to slow this down. <laughs> the bottom line is, is we can't live yesterday, what happened the days previous, this day. We cannot put our stock in what happens tomorrow. Because the bottom line is, is you and I have today. Amen. Today is the day. Today is our day. Today is the day that we have got to live. We've got to spend our time in today. So with that thought in mind, I want to share with you something. I, I want to share a, a quick thought. You know, we the church, I feel like, have lost sight of something that the early church really had a hold of. And I want to kind of emphasize this to you because I want to push the importance of this. If you read your word, if you're reading in the, in the, in the word of God, in the early churches, the churches in Ephesus, the church in Thessalonians, the church in Corinth, all these places, they had an urgency unlike any other that today might be the last day that they were there. That the coming of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was at hand and they never knew when it was going to be. And they lived their life with an urgency that the return of the Lord might be at any time. Yet we, the modern church, we Americans, we've kind of gotten complacent in our relationships. And we say that our relationships with God means that we're going to come and we're going to try to spend the rest of our life doing good. Spend the rest of our life sitting in church, you know, and, and praise Jesus for all it is. But the bottom line is you and I have got to live a life with an urgency that today is the day that we have. That the coming of our Lord and Savior might be at any time, the Bible says, like a thief in the night. Yet sometimes I see that we have lost that sight. And we forget that we are closer this day than any other day to the return of our Lord and Savior. And all we've got right now is today. We have got to live with the urgency of our Lord and Savior. We have got to live with the, 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 the importance that today is a day that you and I have. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow we don't know. We got today. So with that, I want to give you some thoughts, some things to know about living in today. Are you guys with me this morning? You want to get into some things to know about living today so that we can be more impactful for the kingdom of God? Amen. All right, well, let's get into it. Number one this morning, things to know about living today. Number one, today is a gift from God. Today is a gift from God. We just talked about it. You know, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We, don't, we know what yesterday came. And regardless of how we feel, here's the bottom line. All of us in this auditorium this morning opened our eyes. <sighs> Breathe the air. Clear, smoggy, whatever it might be. We are alive today. Today is a gift from God. Now let me, let me bring this into perspective. I'm sure that we can all probably relate either directly or indirectly with this scenario, but we probably have all experienced either the sudden passing of somebody that we love or of somebody that we know. They weren't expecting it. Maybe it was a car accident. Maybe it was a work accident. Maybe it was something with their health. And all of a sudden, they were here one day. Next day, what? They're gone? Are you kidding me? And we've spent those times. Some of us have spent those times in those memorial services. We've seen those people that we haven't talked to or seen in 10 or 15 years. Those family members that maybe we had some issue with and because of the, the death in that family brought them together and said, you know, man, life's too short. We just got, let's, let's go out to lunch. Let's, let's catch up. We really got to work on this relationship together. We've been in those memorial services when we've seen somebody's life pass away before our eyes and we realize that the perspective of our life has opened up, that life is fragile, that tomorrow is not promised, that we don't know where tomorrow leads, but we know today. Just like that person that has, who was once said, now we're remembering. They didn't know that that very moment of their death was it. It just came upon them. It shocked all of us. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that the heart of wisdom is in the house of mourning. What that means is that when you and I are thinking about that person that we have lost, or that person that has passed on, that person, as we're remembering their life, the heart of wisdom is in that in the sense that our perspective on life is changed at that moment. If you've ever left the memorial service, you know, man, there's some things i got to get going. There's some things that I want to do, I want to accomplish before I go. 
And the bottom line is, is that we hold on to that perspective. And then as, as life goes, as the sun rises and the sun sets and the sun rises and the sun sets, we get back into our, our routine. We get back into our habit. We begin to lose that perspective that each and every day is a gift from God. You and I are still here. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter what we're going through in our bodies, whether we're ailing, whether we're grieving, whatever it might be, you and I are alive today. Because we are here, we've got to understand that we are here for a purpose. We're not like a feather in Forrest Gump as it floats around. To a, to a sweet sonnet of music just floating through life. You and I are here each day for a purpose. This day that you and I are here sitting in this chair, listening to this guy tell you about the word, are here for a reason. It is a gift from God. I love what the word of God says in the book of Psalms. The 118th chapter, verse number 24, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead, says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will what? rejoice and be glad in it. You know what I love about that? The tense of that statement. It doesn't say that was the day. That will be the day. It said this is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made church. You and I should rejoice and be glad in it. I love this. This is a perspective that I have. I've learned this, this verse before I even knew the reference or the, 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 the scripture itself. I knew this verse through a song. My brother-in-law, Pastor Henny Bosman, who pastors the Rock Church of Temecula, very deep, very projected voice. I remember as a, as a, as a youth, he used to live next door to Pastor Eddie, who now pastors the Rock Church of, of Coachella. And when I was in Pastor Eddie's house, I could hear Pastor Henny in his house. And he came from South Africa, said that he was going to stay with us for two weeks, just kind of experience America. And two years later, he marries my oldest sister, living in our house for two years. And I remember my brother-in-law, Pastor Henny. And he was always loud. He was always trying to pump you up. He was always just, you know, a real go-getter. And I remember as a, as a, young, as a young child, as a, as a, as a pre-teenager in those times, that Henny would walk around the house and go, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will. And he'd begin to sing that song. Oh, man, Henny, come on, you're funny. <laughs> and I remember that verse from that song. And you know what the thing is, is now that I remember this verse, now that I look at this verse, I begin to proclaim this verse over my life each and every day. One thing, one thing that I do, I make it a point in my soul, in my spirit, every morning before my feet touch the ground as I get out of the bed, I say this verse in my heart. This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice in it. And I can tell you there's been times when my son maybe has woken up early or he's been up all night and it's disrupted our daily routine. And maybe I forgot to say that because I was groggy or I was tired or I was running late to work and I just jumped in the shower and got in the car and ran. And I'll tell you something. I, told, I can tell the difference on the days that I speak the word of God over my life and I remind myself that today is the day that the Lord has made and the days that I don't. And when we speak those things in over our life, when we speak those scriptures over our life, what we're doing is we're doing the first part of Hebrews, the 13th verse, the third chapter, is we are exhorting each other daily. We are reminding ourselves that regardless of what I think today is going to be like, regardless of what my meetings say, regardless of what my, my family is going through, regardless of that, today is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. I love what the book of Philippians in the fourth chapter says. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We even sing that song here in the church as well. Things to say. If you can't remember the scriptures or the passages to the verse, start singing them. Start proclaiming them over your life, reminding yourself that today, church, today, church, is the day that the Lord has made. And today is a gift from the Lord that you and I are still here. And the fact that you and I are still here means that there is still something for us to do. We'll get into that in just a moment. We're talking about some things to know about living in today. Are you guys with me this morning? Are we here? 
Number two for this morning, things to know about living today. Number two, today is a new day. Today is not yesterday. Today is not tomorrow. Today is a new day. Yet so often in our lives, so often because of the experiences that we face, so often because of the hurts and the pains and the things that we carry, we hold on to yesterday and we bring it into today. Are you with me with, on this? Do you guys get what I'm saying? Today is a new day. Yet so often we live our lives. I'm going to show you an example. We had a skit one time a couple years ago for Easter during a song when people carried trash bags and threw them at the cross. And you know what? Our life is the way it is. This life is life. And no, we have drama. We got baggage. <laughs> Sometimes that baggage is a backpack, maybe a little purse, something like that. For you guys, it's called a man bag. But that, but that baggage begins to build up. It gets a little bit bigger. Now it's the size of a carry-on container. Then all of a sudden it gets bigger. Now it's the size of a 50-gallon trash bag. And we start carrying that around. We start carrying yesterday around on our backs today. And we wonder as we're going through today, why is my back hurt? Why am I moving so slow? Why is it so hard for me to push forward, yet we don't even realize the weight that we're carrying on our shoulder? When church, all we have got to do is take yesterday and realize that today is a new day. Today is a new day. You know what? You may be going through something in your life. You may be going through something where you know that you're doing something wrong. And you say, God, I can't get past this. Well, let me tell you something. First and foremost, the grace of God enables you to get out of sin. Jesus Christ came and died on that cross so the, bo the, bondages, uh, the chains of bondage could be broken over your life so you are not bound by that sin anymore. The grace of God is there to get you out of sin and doesn't enable you to stay in that sin. But let me tell you this. You may be going through something where you say, I can't shake this. I can't seem to stop doing this. Maybe it's even this. You know what? This person has hurt me so many times, I can't move on. Or this has happened to me. I've been so scarred. I've been so hurt by the economy, by my job, by the situations around me, by my family, that I can't move on. And I'll tell you this. I've even been in the same situation myself where I feel like, you know, I have made so many mistakes that it's like I, sometimes I feel like God's just going to say to me, you know what? Listen, we tried. <laughs> we, we gave it a good shot. We really gave it a good go. But, you know, it's not me, it's you. And sometimes we feel like that. As a matter of fact, to the point where we, we hinder our own relationship with God based on our own emotions, based on our own feelings, based on how our own situation is going, based on yesterday. But let me show you what the Bible says in the book of Lamentations. I'm just going to put it up on the overhead so we don't spend 20 minutes looking for the book of Lamentations <laughs> in the third chapter. Lamentations 3 verse 22 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Praise God. Woo! Because, why? His compassions fail not. I love this next verse, verse number 23. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Praise God. Praise God. His mercies are new every morning. You think God's compassions wear out on you because you can't get over that hurt, because you can't get over that mistake that you've made, because you said something wrong or you went to this place and you shouldn't have been there. You know what? Get out of it. Make an effort to get out of it. Get close to God. That's the first thing. I'm not going to say that there's an excuse for you to stay in it each and every day. But today is a new day. And what you did yesterday doesn't matter because guess what? Like point number one says, you got a gift from God because you got today. Jesus Christ says, you know what? You don't put old wine, new wines in an old wineskin. If you think about what's a wineskin, back in the day, before they had metal canteens, you think about like with the pioneers, they had a sack of leather that they would put their water and their drink in. And that's, that was made out of a, a hide of some sort of organic material. And as time would go by, that would dry out, that would begin to crumble up, and it would begin to crust up. And wine, being, or, uh, being acidic, being, uh, you know, having some stuff in it that would break down the enzymes of that, of that hide-like uh, material, if you let your old raggedy, dried-up wine skin... You know, you, you left it that way and you put new wine into it because of the nature of that, of that beverage, because of the nature of that drink, it would begin to break it up. And Jesus says that, you know what, that wineskin is going to crumble apart and your wine is going to fall all out. You're going to lose it all. Yet so many times in our lives, church, we put our, our new day in our old wineskin. We live yesterday as our wineskin, but today is our new wine. And we have got to understand that today is a new day, that today is a new experience. Whatever we had in the past doesn't matter because now we are here today. 
And we've got to move past it. We have got to move on. We have got to understand that God has not given up on you and I. God has not given up on you and I. God has not moved on. He has not said, listen, man, we, we tried. We gave it a good run. He says, no, my mercies are new every morning. If you're grieving, if you've got some pain in your life, if, you, if you've lost something that's valuable to you, a family member, a child, a father, a mother, whatever it might be, his mercies are new every morning. And God says, listen, I've been there. I lost a son too. He says, I know my compassion it doesn't fail. My, ner- my mercies are new every morning. Church, all you and I have to understand is that today is a new day that we can lean upon our God and understand that, you know what, while we're here today, while we're experiencing this gift, we can live in the mercies of our God because they're new. God doesn't look at us and say, Psh, man, I cannot believe that you did that. His mercies never fail. His compassion never fails. Are you with me this morning? Amen. We're talking about things to know about living today. Number three, today is the best day to act, to do something. Today is the best day to act. Like I said earlier about the gift of God, today being a gift of God, today is the best day for you and I to make use of it. The gift of God is that you and I are here, so why not let, let's not take that gift for granted, but rather let's do something. Oftentimes what we do is we live today waiting for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll do that. Tomorrow I'll speak to that person. Tomorrow I'll share the love of God. Tomorrow I'll do what God's asked me to do. Today, I just want to rest. And we hope that tomorrow comes. We live in the expectation that tomorrow comes. And let me tell you something. I can tell you this. I'll be open and I'll be honest. Pastor Luke has a natural tendency to be a procrastinator. I like to live tomorrow today. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was in college, I wrote a 20-page paper the day before it was due when I had like six months to write it. That was not easy. I can tell you just from that experience right there, don't live tomorrow, today. You know, one thing I like to do, I like to, one of my hobbies, one of the things I really like to do, it was was in my family, my grandfathers were cabinet makers, and uh, there's just something in me that I have to build things. All my life I was with Legos and, and things of that nature. Now, as an adult, I have a workshop in my garage. I got, I got all the, the furniture making things. I've made entertainment centers. I made an entertainment center for my house. I made an entertainment center for my neighbor's house. I've made picture frames. I've made all sorts of different shelves and toys and furniture and things of that nature. I love to work with wood. But let me tell you something. I'm the type of person that I get to about 80% of the way through things, and then I start looking for tomorrow. I start getting bored with where I'm at at that very moment, and I start looking to what's coming up ahead because I can't finish what I do. So here's where I go through. I get all through the progress process. I get all the wood together. It looks good. Oh, man. But there's no finish on it. If you've ever seen cabinets, you've ever seen furniture, wood without finish doesn't last for very long. So then what I do is I start to look at the next project so I don't sand like I should. I don't pay attention to the finishing process like I should. And then all of a sudden I put the finish on it and I look at it and say, oh, ah, it's terrible. I hate finishing. And what I do, I built my entertainment center. I had to paint it three times. I built my neighbor's entertainment center, my neighbor and I. We had to stain it three times because I don't pay attention to what's, what's ahead of me or what's right at my feet right there, what's at, in front of me at the moment. I'm looking at what's the next project because I'm already done with this one. And that the problem is with our walks with God, with our faith, with the things that you and I are believing for, the things that you and I have a conviction in our hearts, the things that we say, you know what, I'm gonna stand firm on the rock for this. We do the same thing. We get about 80, 80% of the way through it, 75% of the way through it. We say, man, I'm bored. I'm ready for the next thing to come along. And we start moving on and we lose track of today and we start looking at tomorrow. Today is the best day to act. When we keep focus on what's at hand, when we keep focus on where we're going, when we keep focus on what God has placed in front of us for this day, then we, it's the best day to act. We realize this is the best day to speak to somebody. This is the best day to reach out. This is the best day. Because tomorrow, like James says, you don't know. Your life is a vapor. I can say it, the Lord wills, I'll be able to finish my entertainment center tomorrow, but right now I've got today to do it. Yeah. Same thing with your faith. You can say it, the Lord wills, maybe I'll get it tomorrow, but today is the day I'm going to stand for it and believe in it. Today is the day that I am going to act and do something for the kingdom of God. You know what, I don't care if you're 9 years old or if you're 99 years old. You have got today, today is a gift from God. It is never too late for you to act. Let me show you. In the word of God. 
In Luke, the 23rd chapter. 43rd verse. I'm going to read a little bit before. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a summary here. We see that Jesus Christ is, is on the cross. This is the time of the crucifixion. We know that the Bible describes that he's got a, a, a criminal on one side and a criminal on the other side. You know the classic, you know, the classic uh, silhouetted image of the cross and the two on the side, the three crosses. Jesus is on the cross. He's been crucified. And he's got two criminals. And one criminal begins to speak up and says, come on. If you're, the, if you're the savior of the world, save yourself and save us. He begins to call out to Jesus, come on, what's up? Prove yourself. As he's dying on the cross. And the criminal on the other side of Jesus says to that criminal who spoke against Jesus, who's mocked after him and said, don't you know who you're talking to? He says, listen, you and I are guilty of our crimes. We are on this cross because we have been found guilty. We earned our spot here, but that man is innocent. And he spoke up. He said something. He acted on that day. The day of his death. The day, the final breaths of his life. And check out what he says. In Luke, the 23rd chapter, the 43rd verse, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. With his final breaths, as his life was drawing to an end on his deathbed, he says, Lord, remember me. What does Jesus say? Jesus, it's never too late. His mercies never fail. His compassion never ending while he's breathing his final breath, while his body is already beginning to shut down from what the atrocities that have been done to him says to that criminal. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today, today, assuredly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. The Lord and Savior on that cross says to that, that criminal, to that thief, whatever he was, says, listen, you stuck your neck out. You acted. You seized the day. You saw that today was the day to do something. It doesn't matter how far in life you are, how advanced in life you are, how worthless you think you may be now because of your situation. Today is the best day to act. And it is never, never, never too late to do something for God. Today is the best day. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing and he's quoting the Old, Old Testament. He says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. Speaking that God is speaking to his children. He says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Now, Paul the Apostle steps in and comments on this. And he says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The Apostle Paul didn't say, hey, listen, behold, man, he came in. That was that was the accepted time. Behold, this will be the time of salvation. Paul the Apostle says to the church, he says, listen, behold, right now is the time. Right now is the acceptable time. Right now is the time of our salvation. It is time for you and I to accept what has been done for us and to act upon it. You guys with me this morning? We got one more. Can you handle one more? Can we do one more? One more. Thoughts, things to know about living in today. Number four, last for this morning. Today is the best day to shout. Today is the best day to shout. Each and every day we go through our lives and we say, yeah, you know what? I understand that today has been a gift. I understand that, that today is the best day to act. I understand that I'm not living in yesterday, but man, I don't feel good today. I don't feel like there's anything for me to shout about. What, am I, what do I have to say? I have no testimony yet. Today is the best day to shout. First of all, you, you have the best reason to shout. Why? Because we just read your salvation is today. Your salvation is at hand. There's a reason right there to shout. What God has done for you. God pulled you out of the muck and mire, out of, a, out, out of the path to hell, and now you are saved. You are adopted into the kingdom of God. Hello. Today is the best day to shout. You know, I, got a, I, I know a good friend. And they, they, they had been, been pressed upon their hearts to, to witness to their neighbors, to minister to their neighbors in their neighborhood. And they were kind of trying to figure out what should they do. You know, they didn't want to be pushy or overly exertive. So they, they prayed and, they, you know, the Lord pressed upon their hearts. Just do good things for them. Just be nice. Just, just lead it as an example. And so they, they were just doing nice deeds for them. They did some, some things that were just nice gesturely, nice neighborly gesture. What that did, though, is that opened up 
the opportunity. One day the neighbor began to talk to them and they began to start and say, oh yeah, you know, you do this. And they said, yeah, we go to this church. And they began to start shouting about what God is doing in their lives. They began to share with them what God is doing. And guess what? That neighbor said, all right, let me come check it out. And they came. They got saved. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. Then the neighbor came and they brought their family and their family started getting saved. Do you see where we're going? If we shout, today is the best day for us to uh, open our mouths and let God fill it with a shout. Today is the best day for us to open our mouths and let the world know how good our Lord and Savior is. Today is the best day to make it known. Not tomorrow. It wasn't yesterday. Today is the best day to shout. Let me show you what it says in the book of Romans. If you got your Bibles, let's just turn there real quick as we conclude. And this is our last verse for this morning. Romans, the second chapter. I'm sorry, Romans, the 13th chapter. I don't, I don't know where I got the second chapter. But Romans, the 13th chapter. Paul, the apostle, speaking to the church. As you turn there, I'll just give you a little bit of background. He's telling them, he says, listen, you got to understand that your authority, wherever it may be, however you may feel, is of God. you got to respect your authority. you got to pay your taxes to who your taxes are due if you live in those lands. you got to be respectful. you got to act like a Christian. you got to love your neighbor. you got to do these things that Jesus Christ has told us to do. you got to act like a Christian is what Paul, the apostle, is telling the church. And then in the 11th verse, he says, and do this. All those things. Pay your taxes. Do all the things. Act like a Christian ought to act. And, and do this knowing the time. I don't have a watch on. But I know what the time is. And he says that now is high time. That now is high time to what? To awake out of sleep. And for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He says, listen, now is high time. It is the time right now to wake up. Last year was our silent year. Last year was our year of rest. Now is the time, church, for you and I to wake up. Because our salvation is nearer now. The urgency of Jesus Christ in our life is more now than it ever has been. He says, wake up, our salvation is nearer than we first believed. I love what verse number 12 says. And that the night is far set. Yesterday is over. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the proper armor of light. Let us put on the armor of light. Now is the high time. The day, the night is far spent, church. Now it is time for you and I to rise up, for you and I to realize who we are in Christ, to realize that each and every day that we live our lives, we ought to live it like it's a gift from God. That each and every day we live our lives, we have got to understand that it is a new day from God. Each and every day that we live our lives, we have got to understand that that is the best day to act. And we have got to live our lives understanding that today is the best day to shout. Did you get something out of the Word of God this morning? Hallelujah. Two more things I want to do. I want to remind you yet that I am the Young Adults Pastor here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center and that we have a Young Adult Service for you on Fridays at 7 o'clock. The bulletin cover says in the, in the Love Rock Cafe. That's okay. It's actually in the youth room. But the Love Rock Cafe is on the way to the youth room, so either way you'll find it. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 28, you're single or married, you need to come on Friday night and check out what we're doing in the Young Adult, the young adult Service. I'll tell you what, it's, it's just out of this world. Last, the last Friday we had a, we called it a hot topic night, where people could text Pastor Joey and myself while we're on the stage questions about the Bible, questions about their life, and we would answer them right on the, who does that? That's awesome. You say, well, you know, Pastor Luke, I'm, I'm above that age. Well, let me say this. Parents, if you've got an 18-year-old bum at home, Kick them out on Friday night to the young adult service. I'm not done yet. Parents, if you got a 28-year-old bum at home, <laughs> kick them out to the young adult service. We'd love to have them. Introduce them to some godly people. Get them connected into the things of God so they get rooted and grounded at a young age so they continue on in life. You don't want to miss it. If you're 18 to 28 year old, years old, we'll see you on Friday night, 7 o'clock. Listen, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask everybody, please give me a moment more of your attention. I want to ask you a question very important. If you were to leave this place tonight, or this morning, excuse me. If you were to leave this place this morning and you were to die, however it may happen, heaven forbid that be, that, that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? Simple question. Let's answer that within your heart. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, if I was to die, I think I'd get to heaven. I hope I'd get to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. 
Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because you think that you're gonna get to heaven, because you hope that you're gonna get to heaven, because you really wanna go to heaven, can you show me in the word of God where it says that you're gonna get there? Like the most positive outlook on life means that you're gonna get there. You think you can, you think you can, you think you can, that means you're gonna get there. Nowhere will you find that. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure that heaven exists. I'm not sure that hell exists. Let me tell you something. Just because you say in your heart, because you believe in your head that heaven or hell is not real or is real doesn't matter. It is a very real place. As a matter of fact, it's real enough for the God, to, through the inspired word of God, to mention it in the Bible. It's real enough for Jesus Christ himself to speak about it. Therefore, it's real enough for you and I to take it seriously enough to know that whether we see it, believe it or not, it's there and it exists. It's like saying, I don't believe in a semi-truck and go stand in the slow lane of the freeway. Lo and behold, you meet one face to face. Just because you believe that hell doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not real. I love you enough, I respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games with you. Well, you know, you say, Pastor Luke, you know, uh, I, was, uh, I, I, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of philosophical thought or world religion. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven kind of by default? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of philosophical thought, or world religion of any type, that because you weren't in those categories, by default, that means you go to heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere will you find that in the Word of God. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, as a, as a child, I was baptized. I was christened. I attended Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism classes. My parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because somebody blew smoke and water over you as a baby, because you attended Sabbath school, catechism, or su uh, Sunday school classes, because you attended church on Christmas and on Easter, that you're going to get your way in heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, all my life I've called myself a Christian. I live in America. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to go to heaven? Can you show me where it says it because you give yourself a title, because you call yourself a Christian, that you're going to get into the, the kingdom of heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere does it say that. Nowhere does it say that because you live in America because the money that you carry in your wallet says in God we trust means that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere will you find that. Yet so many of us believe that. How about this? You might even say, you know what, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't drive over the speed limit. I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I even give to help fight world hunger. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the word of God where it says it because you're a good person, because of your good deeds, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you don't drive over the speed limit, because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven, because you even give to charitable do donations and, and to help fight world hunger, that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me where it says that because you're a good person? No, in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do will ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's not about that. I love you enough. I honor you enough. I respect you enough today in the house to tell you the truth. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, uh, uh, I was a leader in my last church. I, I, I carried the pastor's Bible. I know, I know who God is. I know the stories of Jesus. I know the stories of Moses and of Jonah. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Just because you know about God, because you have some mental ascent towards God, doesn't mean that you're going to get your way into heaven. Because you were a leader in your last church, because you carried your pastor's Bible, because you were an usher, you sang in the choir, whatever it might be, you might even have a card in your wallet that says that you're a member of a church. Just because you have that doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. Let me show you. The book of John, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think that Jesus would look at Nicodemus and say, Nicodemus, man, Pat on the back, keep on going. Let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his time. Because Nicodemus was a religious leader of his time, he had dedicated his young life to memorizing the scripture of God. More than most of you and I can say all together. Nicodemus said the right things. He could teach from the, the, the pulpits of his church, the synagogue. He gave to the poor. He, he devoted his life to scripture. You would think that Nick, Jesus would say to Nicodemus, pat on the back, man, you, you're on the right path. You keep on going. But Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? Hollywood, popular culture, society, they've made such a mockery out of that term. You think of radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something, church, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given Jesus Christ all of your heart. You've given him all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. God is not after your mental ascent towards him. 
He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ speaking to a church, people like you and I sitting, hearing the word of God, doing good things. He says, listen, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth, Jesus says. Oh, that's pretty vulgar. What Jesus Christ is saying is, listen, if I find you lukewarm, when it comes time for me to meet you face to face, I will spit you out. I will reject you out. One person even told me that that translation means that I will cast you out of the kingdom of heaven as worthless. Pretty harsh words. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means. Lukewarm means this means that you're a little bit up. You're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, cross or crucifix around your neck. Maybe you got a token prayer here and again. Doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. You're riding that fence. Jesus Christ says, if that's you, if you're lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking that you have place in the kingdom of God. In a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you've never given Jesus Christ all your heart, all your life, in a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you're not sure, in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make sure. If you've been living lukewarm, in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to get hot for Jesus. You say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you go through. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll get there all the same. Love wins. Let me tell you something. God loved you enough to make sure that he did everything in his power to get you into the kingdom of heaven. In the sense that he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die so that you and I could be reunited with God. In that, Jesus Christ says of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man, church, no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. This morning, let's do it God's way. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible just like that. If that's you, I'm going to ask you, if you've never given Jesus Christ all your heart, all your life, I'm going to ask you in a moment, just to pop your hand up. If you're not sure, I'm going to ask you, pop your hand up. If you've been living lukewarm in just a moment, all at the same time, we'll do it. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You know what you're doing? You're saying by the, by the raising of your hand, you're saying, you know what, I'm going to surrender my life to God. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to move forward for God. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. This morning, let's do it God's way. You say, Pastor Luke, if I pop my hand up, somebody's going to see me, I'm going to be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed by putting your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. You've got to accept Jesus Christ. You've got to acknowledge that you need him, that you want to give him all of your heart and all of your life. You can only invite him in. He has done everything in his power to get you there. The decision now is yours. All across this auditorium, all at the same time, hands are getting ready to go up as I clap my hands on this Bible. One, if you're not sure, make sure. Two, if you haven't done this, don't leave this place today. Number three, if you've been living lukewarm, let's do it. Bang! Pop your hand up. I got you. One, two, three, four. Got you. Five, six, seven, eight. Eight wise people. Anybody else? If I got you, I need to put your hand back down. I got you. Eight wise people over here. Where you at? I see somebody waving. Where, where you at? Just kind of give me a little wave so I can see you. I can acknowledge you. I got you. Nine. Anybody else in this place? Ten. Eleven. Where you at? I see you. Twelve. Praise God. Twelve wise people. If, I'm not, if I haven't seen you, just kind of give me a little wave so I can see it. 12 wise people. 13, praise God, I got you. 13 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you if that's you. 14, I think I got you guys. Have you guys raised your hand yet? Just wave yes or no. Did you wave them? All right, I got you. 14. Where you at? 15, I see you. Praise God. 15 wise people. Where are you at? Spirit of God's moving in this place. If that's you, go and pop your hand up. 16, I got you. 16 wise people. I see you pointing over here. Ha, ah, I'm having a hard time seeing. Wait, give me a little wave over here so I can see you. Come on. 17, I got you. People are pointing all over the place, man. 17 wise people. Is there anybody else in this house? If you know there's 17, you know there's 20. Where are you at? 18, got you. Where's 19 and 20? Where are you at? Quit resisting. Put your hand up. Today is the best day to act. If that's you in this place. 19, where are you at? Number 20. 20, I got you. Praise God for 20 wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God, praise God. Here's what I want to do. 
I'm mean, in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that you need Jesus by raising your hand. You get saved by asking him to come into your heart, come into your life. So I'm going to ask you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, the person next to you if you need to. I want you to get out of your chairs. Everybody gets up, and I want you to come and meet me down at the altar. You said you wanted to give Jesus Christ all your heart, all your life. Let us help us. Come. You can come today. Get out of your chair and come on down. You can come. Lord, I give you my heart. Welcome, welcome. Come on. You can come. They're coming. You can come. Come on. If you're in the family rooms, come on down. Come on. Every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Welcome, welcome. Come on. Welcome. They're coming. Give me my They're coming. Soul. Praise God. Praise God. I live for you. They're still coming. Welcome. Welcome. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, have your way. They're still coming. Let's make them welcome, church. Lord, I give you my heart. Hey guys, today is a new day. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of you to mine. This is my friend, Pastor Dave. You thought, man, maybe Pastor Luke's pretty cool. No, that guy's where it's at. What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray a prayer with you. Don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart and into your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free stuff. Free stuff! Literature that our pastor wrote. A book called Welcome to Your Destiny. It says, hey, you know what? Super easy reading. Pastor Jim's got a third grade reading level, so he wrote it so that we could all understand it. <laughs> Super easy. He says, you know what? I just got saved. Where do I go from here? He's going to do one more thing. He's going to introduce to you a friend, somebody we have here called a spiritual personal trainer. Like when you go to a gym and you see the personal trainer and they help you build those muscles and they make sure that you're eating right, we have spiritual personal trainers here, somebody that will meet with you before service. They'll teach you some principles of things about uh, the Word of God to help you get strong in your relationship with God so that you don't go back to the stuff that you came from. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Dave.